I'm delighted that you've joined us for this series titled Three Cosmic Messages, Earth's Final Conflict. This is the sixth in a 13-part series on the Bible prophecies of Revelation, especially focusing on Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. In those verses, God gives to us three messages pictured as being carried by angels in mid-heaven that are go to the end of the earth just before his return. In this presentation, we're going to focus on verse 6, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven, earth, the fountains of waters. So stay with us. You will be absolutely thrilled as you sense the meaning of these verses and God speaking to your own heart through them. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you have not left this world in uncertainty. You've not left this world without a message, a message that comes from your heart to prepare it for your soon return. Help us to have open minds, receptive spirits, to grasp your message for this hour. In Christ's name, amen. The book of Revelation is not merely a book to fill our heads with mystic symbols, cryptic signs, and strange beasts. The book of Revelation is designed to compel us, to lead us to make eternal decisions in our lives and to really compel us to action. Some time ago, I was thinking about a concert that may have taken place in, Con in Carnegie Hall with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Now, this is in my imagination only, and I need to clarify that before I go into the story. So let's suppose that you've bought tickets to the Carnegie Hall. Let's suppose that you're sitting in this concert. It's an absolutely amazing concert. You sit on the edge of your seat. You're thrilled with the music. You're, taking all, you're taken into the stratosphere with the rapturous playing of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. You've paid a great deal for those seats. And then somebody in the middle of that concert begins to yell, fire, fire. Now you have really three choices if that happens. Choice number one, you think this guy is an absolute lunatic. They're a crazy nut. I can't wait till the security comes and takes them away. Secondly, you might think, you know what, this may be true. You're, you're thankful that a person has yelled fire. There's been no danger yet. You jump up and run out with a thankful spirit. The third option is maybe you think, I better get out of here, but you're angry, you're bitter because you spent a lot of money for the uh, tickets. You may have those three options. Look, to yell fire when there is no fire is a very serious thing. I mean, somebody can get trampled, some others can get severely injured, rushing to the exit, somebody may be stress-filled and have a heart attack. So if you yell fire and there's no fire, that's pretty serious. But warnings are valid only if the crisis is real. When you have a real crisis and somebody warns you of that crisis, that indeed is extremely a valid warning. The warning in the book of Revelation is not a warning that comes in harshness. It's not a warning from a God that is an authoritarian judge or a tyrant. The warning in the book of Revelation is a warning in love. And Revelation really is a book about the grace, the mercy, the goodness, the love of God. The book of Revelation is an appeal to us to know Christ as the dying lamb, to know Christ as the living priest. The book of Revelation is a book about Jesus Christ. And the warnings that we receive in Revelation are warnings given to us in love. They're warnings given by three angels that symbolically fly in mid-heaven. These warnings are very similar to the warnings that God gave to Noah before the earth was destroyed by water. The earth was destroyed then by water, and it will be destroyed another time by fire. In Noah's day, Noah preached for 120 years, warning that the flood was coming. In the book of Revelation, we have Revelation's end time judgment. 
And we saw in our last presentation that the clock struck the hour prophetically at the end of the 2300 year prophecy in 1844. So just as Noah preached for decades, over a century, so the message of God has been going out for well over a century in this world population to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. What were the conditions like in Noah's day and how do they compare to our conditions in our day? Notice Genesis 6 verse 3 says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. So God reaches out in mercy. He graciously reaches out in love. But his spirit that leads to decision does not always appeal to human beings. There'll come a time when human beings have made their final irrevocable decision. There'll come a period of time in Earth's history where every person has had ample opportunity, where every person has had the privilege of responding to God's love, and they've made their solid, irrevocable choice. God does not withdraw his spirit arbitrarily. He doesn't withdraw his spirit and say, those that are in are in, and those that are out are out. When God's message went forth in the days of Noah, and when Noah and his family entered into the ark and the door was shut, it was not shut when many more could have honestly, graciously repented, confessed their sin, and entered in. It was shut because they had made their final decision. So probation in this world will not arbitrarily close by God. It will be the signal that every human being has already made their decision. What were, were the conditions in the days of Noah? Genesis 6 verse 5, it really seems like conditions today. Then the Lord saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. You don't have to spend too much time on television, even looking at the ads, too much time on the internet, when you recognize quite dramatically that the wickedness of man has been great in the earth. You don't have to spend much time with news media, news magazines, or newspapers to understand that the intent of the thoughts of his heart is evil continually. When Billy Graham finished writing his first draft of one of his books called World Aflame, it's reported that he gave the first chapter to his wife, Ruth, and when she read it, she said something like this, Billy, if Jesus does not come soon, he's going to have to resurrect Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize to them. In every age of Earth's history, there have been a period of time when human probation has come to an end. In every age of Earth's history, there's been a time when the wickedness of man has filled the cup of iniquity, where God has given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And that's really the message in the days of Noah. It's the message in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the message in the days of Daniel in Babylon with Belshazzar, when the handwriting was written on the wall, many, many tekel Eupharsin, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And it's really the message of the three angels. It is the message of the first angel, which is an urgent appeal to men and women everywhere to make their decisions for Christ and make them today. The message of these three angels is God's final warning. It's his final message of hope. It is a hope-filled, grace-filled message of love to this generation. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 and 10 says, The day of the Lord, that's the coming of Christ, will come as a thief. That is, it will come rapidly, quickly, unexpectedly in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up. The earth was destroyed by water once, and it will indeed be destroyed by fire a second time. Jesus is coming, though not primarily to destroy the earth. Christ's intent is not simply to destroy our world. It is rather to destroy wickedness so righteousness will reign. It's not to destroy the evil, although that will be the natural result of his coming. It is to redeem the righteous. Jesus is coming because heaven is empty without you. The fellowship that Christ has with the angels and the cherubims and seraphims, that fellowship is incomplete without you. Jesus is coming because he wants you. He wants you to live in a land where there is no sickness, suffering, death, heartache, pain anymore. 
He wants you to be with him forever. And that's the message of the three angels. That's the message of these three cosmic beings that fly in midheaven. That's the message in Earth's final conflict, the message of a loving God, a message to prepare men and women for the last days of human history. Let's go to the heart of the book of Revelation and see the details of this specific message. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7 says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. We studied that in the last two presentations in this series. The hour of God's judgment has come. The clock has struck the hour. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now notice the expression, fear God and give glory to him. We ask the question, what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to give glory to him? What appeal is this practically to our hearts? How indeed do we fear God? How indeed do we place our allegiance on the behalf of God and in his grace and mercy? Is this message, fear God, one in which God appeals to us to tremble and shake before him? Certainly there is that sense of reverence and respecting God, but this word fear in the original language of the New Testament Greek is phoebo, and it has this sense of reverence, awe, and respect, but it goes beyond that. This word fear or phoebo in scripture has to do with a large idea. It has to do with the idea that I respect God enough to obey him. It has to do with a thinking process in my mind that leads me to decide to do whatever Christ commands, knowing that his commands are best and in my best behalf. It is not a command of force. It is a loving appeal for obedience. In the book Desire of Ages on the Life of Christ, in page 22, I read, the exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. You see, the devil uses force, not God. He, God, desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. Only by love is love awakened. And so that's why in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven with the everlasting gospel. The gospel, the love of God revealed in the life, death, resurrection, and intercession of Christ in heaven above, that love of God enables us to respond foebo, to fear God or to obey God. That love leads us to obedience. You know, it continues in Desire of Ages, page 22, to know God is to love him. His character must be manifest in contrast to the character of Satan. So in the book of Revelation, God's love reaches out to us, leading us to loving obedience, leading us to respect, reverence him, that's fear him, enough to obey him. That is in contrast to the beast power. The beast power in Revelation forces. The beast power in Revelation coerces. The beast power in the book of Revelation passes a decree where no man can buy or sell it unless they worship the beast. The beast power in the book of Revelation, this political religious antichrist power, persecutes the people of God like church state unions have done in the past. He also passes a death decree on the people of God. So you see this amazing contrast, a contrast between God's love that leads to willing obedience outlined in this message of the first angel, and Satan, who tries to coerce and force allegiance. The contrast could not be greater. This battle over the law of God, this battle over the throne of God, this battle over who has the authority to rule, is described in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. Lucifer says, I will ascend into heaven. Wasn't he already in heaven? He wanted a higher place. I'll exalt my throne above the stars of God. My throne above the stars of God. Throne implies rulership. He wants to rule. I'll sit on the mount of the congregation. Notice this. He says, on the farthest sides of the north. What was the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north of Israel? Mount Sinai. What came from Mount Sinai? The law of God. 
I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll be like the Most High. So Lucifer, a created being, did not want to worship the Creator. Lucifer, a created being, wanted to exalt himself above the Creator. He wanted to sit on the throne and rule. He wanted to make law and not obey law. So the question of the controversy between good and evil was over authority. Does God have the authority to rule? Is God a loving ruler? Does God have his, the best interest of his creatures in view? In the last days of earth's history, in the messages of the three angels that go forth, God sends an eternal message to the ends of the earth, showing that his people willingly, lovingly, openly desire to please him in everything they do. This fear God has to do with this mental commitment that we make knowing that God's commands are for our best good and to lovingly, graciously serve him. We discover the depth of the meaning of the expression fear God by observing its usage in other parts of the Bible. In other words, if you want to know what the Bible teaches on a subject, you take that expression and you travel through the Bible. And as you travel through the Bible, you look at how that expression is used in the Bible. So when the Bible uses the expression fear God, what does it mean? What does this expression indicate to us? Let's journey through scripture and let's look at the expression and how it's used. Deuteronomy 6 verse 2, fear the Lord your God. So here it is, fear God, to keep all his commandments and statutes which I command you. So here, fearing God is linked to a reverence or respect for God that leads us to obey him and keep his commandments. Here's another one, Psalm 119, verse 73 and 74. Your hands have fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you, that is respect you, will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. So what, according to these passages, does it mean to fear God? It means to be glad, to be joyous in our obedience to him. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14 says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now, this is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, respect or obey him, and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. What duty of man is this? It's the whole duty of man. So this says, fear God, keep his commandments. For this, indeed, is the whole, the entire duty of man. So the book of Revelation, the appeal of the first angel's message is an appeal that leads us back to obedience. It leads us back to the gladness in the joy that we have in life when we please God. The Bible says God will bring every work into judgment. Now notice judgment is included in Revelation 14 verse 7. The average judgment has come. Commandments of God are included there in the idea of respect or obey him. Fear God, for God, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Again, throughout the Bible, you have this linkage. You have this integrated unity of obeying God because we love God, responding to his grace in obedience, and the idea of judgment that will be judged by the very choices we make, judged by the lives that we live. In the light of the judgment hour, heaven's urgent appeal is for those saved by grace to live godly lives. Now, there are those people that have this strange idea that when I come to Jesus, it's, it's Jesus only. And for them, the Jesus only means uh, Jesus only from the sense that he saved me from the guilt and condemnation of my sin, but there's not much emphasis on obedience, not much emphasis on Bible doctrine. You cannot separate Christ from doctrine. To accept Jesus is not to accept some mythical Jesus, some mystical Jesus, some ethereal Jesus. To accept Jesus is to accept the teachings of Christ. It's to understand that when I come to Christ, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. When I come to Jesus, I'm saved by grace, saved totally by grace. There is no other salvation beside grace. But when I am saved by grace, that leads me not to disobedience, but to obedience. It leads me not 
to walk away from the commandments, but walk toward the commandments, not as legalistic requirements, but as glad tidings of the character of Jesus Christ himself. The gospel not only delivers us from the guilt of our past, it empowers us to live godly, obedient lives in the present. So the gospel is a complete gospel. It delivers us from the guilt of sin and delivers us from the grip of sin. It delivers us from the penalty of a broken law and it delivers us from the bondage and power of the broken law. The grace of Christ is the grace he gives us for obedience. Romans 1 verse 5. Notice this. We've received grace and apostleship for what? What do we receive grace for? What do we receive apostleship for? For obedience to the faith among all nations. So faith does not lead me from works, but to works. When people ask me, do you believe in Jesus only? I say to them, I believe in the Jesus only of the Bible. The Jesus only of the Bible saves us by his grace. The Jesus only of the Bible transforms us by his love. The Jesus only of the Bible empowers us by his power. The Jesus only of the Bible transforms our lives. The Jesus only of the Bible is the Jesus of the book of Revelation that leads us to fear God, respect God, and obey God. In the book Christ Triumphant, page 235, I read, those who are truly converted to Christ must keep on constant guard lest they accept error in the place of truth. Now, what is this error that they may accept in the place of truth? Here it is. Those who think it matters not what they believe in doctrine, so long as they believe in Christ, are on dangerous ground. What kind of ground are they on, everybody? They're on dangerous ground because you cannot separate Christ from the teachings of Christ. You cannot separate Christ from doctrine. So the Jesus that was here talked about the Bible as his word. He said, sanctify them through my word. Thy word is truth, John 17, verse 17. When you accept Christ, you accept his word. Jesus said, for example, that there's no other way of salvation. When you accept Christ, you accept him as the way of salvation. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. John 14, 1 to 3, if it were not so, I would have told you. I'm coming again. If you accept Christ, you believe his teachings. He's coming again. If you accept Christ, you accept fully the teachings of Christ about obedience, the Bible Sabbath, and the teachings of the Creator God. If you accept Christ, you accept what he has said about death and life and the resurrection. Those who think it matters not what they believe in doctrine, so long as they believe in Jesus Christ, are on what kind of ground? Dangerous ground. Christ is the embodiment of all doctrinal truth. So when we accept Christ, we accept the embodiment of truth as it's revealed in Scripture. We do not turn our backs on the Christ who has proclaimed that truth. Andrew Bonner, great Christian writer, states it really succinctly when he says this, instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from what? Grace. It is not the importance of the thing, but the majesty of the lawgiver that is to be the standard of obedience. Some indeed might reckon such minute and arbitrary rules as these as trifling. Boner goes on, but the principle involved in obedience or disobedience was none other than the same principle which was tried in Eden at the foot of the forbidden tree. It is really this, is the Lord to be obeyed in all things whatsoever he commands. Is he a holy lawgiver? Are his creatures bound to give implicit assent to his will? You see, the issue is far more than the specific command. The issue is the authority of the lawgiver. The issue is, do we accept a limited Christ or do we accept the fullness of Christ? Do we accept the beauty of the greatness of Christ? And to disobey the commands of Christ is to disobey accepting the fullness of Christ. Christ has more for you than you can possibly imagine. 
Christ has more for you beyond in your life that's greater than simply saying, oh, I accept Christ. Now I can live like I please. Now I can do like I please. Jesus invites you into the depth of his experience. That's why he says, fear God, obey God, respect God, fear God. That respect is the mental attitude of obedience that leads us to do whatever Jesus says. Revelation is an urgent appeal in the light of heaven's judgment hour to make God the center of our lives. Some people make money the center of our lives. You see, we all have a certain center in our life. Some people make pleasure the center of their lives. Some people make sports the center of their lives. Some people make entertainment the center of their lives. But Revelation's appeal is an urgent appeal to make Jesus Christ as the center of our lives. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, Seek you first. Seek you what? Seek you first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So Revelation's appeal in Revelation 14, verse 7, fear God, is an appeal for priorities in our lives. It is an appeal to make Christ the priority of our life. Colossians 3, verse 2 says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. Notice the verb here, set your mind. Set your mind means to make a conscious, decided choice. A decided choice to place Christ first in your life and to make your greatest desire to please him. Now, what does it mean to give glory to God? Fearing God has to do with your thinking process, a thought process in which you desire to obey him, to please him in whatever he asks. Now, what does it mean to give glory to God? Because remember, our text says, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. So in the hour of God's judgment, we live respectful, reverential lives that obey God. And we say, God, whatever you ask me to do, I want to do. Giving glory to God has to do with our lifestyle. It has to do with the way we live. Fearing God has to do with what we think, the commitment in our minds to obey him. Giving glory to God has to do with what we do, carrying out that commitment in our minds, in our lives. As you look at life today, there are many people that have this idea. They have the idea that their body is some kind of fun house and whatever is pleasurable, they want to do that. Whether it's smoking, drinking, whatever they eat, their idea is, look, what I take into my body is separate and distinct from my faith. Their idea is that I can believe in Christ, but yet I can act how I desire. When we come to Jesus Christ, we act not how we desire, but how he desires. We do not what we want, but what he wants. Our daily commitment is like the commitment of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane three times? He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Was Jesus looking forward to the cross? Did he walk to the cross singing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow? Not at all. Jesus knew that he would be betrayed by Judas. He knew that his closest followers would forsake him. He knew that he would have nails driven through his hands and be filled with pain and anguish. He knew as well that he would bear the sins of all humanity on Calvary's cross. Jesus knew that. He said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will. Jesus took the cup of suffering, the cup of sorrows, to save you and me. As we come to Christ and enter into the depths of his love, life becomes not one insane desire for pleasure, but it becomes a deep commitment to do God's will, a deep commitment to please him in all things. We pray with Jesus, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. We say, Lord, I want to glorify you in everything. 
I want to glorify you in what I take into my body. I want to glorify you in the example that I make to other people. Some time ago, I was helping a dear lady quit smoking. She had smoked for over 30 years. She was a grandmother by now and uh, loved her grandchildren, often told me about her grandchildren. And she was having this terrible struggle to quit smoking. I was praying for her. I was quoting the promises of God for her. And one day she came to see me and she said, Pastor, you're never going to guess what? I said, what is it? I said, I quit. I quit. I said, well, what, what motivated you? What prompted you? She said, you know, I was sitting in a chair at home, my favorite chair, watching my favorite TV program, and I had lit up a cigarette and I was smoking it. And my little granddaughter jumped up on my lap, little six, seven-year-old, and she looked in my eyes and said, Grandma, when I grow up, I want to light a cigarette just like you. I want to hold it just like you hold it, Grandma, and I want to smoke just like you. She said, look, Pastor, I love that girl so much. I know that I have the raspy throat. I know that I have the, the burning in my lungs. I know the potential. And pastor, I would not want that for my daughter. My love for her, I, I give this up. I throw this down. If love for a granddaughter can cause a grandma to give up cigarettes, if love can do that, doesn't our love for Christ fill our hearts and say, Lord, whatever it is, alcohol, tobacco, foods that are destroying my body, a lifestyle of worldliness and the pleasures of this world. Lord, I want to set my affection on things above. I want to give glory to you and what my eyes see. I want to give glory to you and my ears hear. I want to give glory to you and everything I do. If somebody says, is not this legalism? This is not legalism. This is Christianity. In Christianity, we live not to please ourselves. In Christianity, we live to please the living Christ. In Christianity, our desire is one thing. Our desire is to say, Lord, whatever it is in my life, I desire to please you. Romans 12 verse 1 says, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you, that is, I urge you, I admonish you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that's brothers and sisters, men and women, by the mercies of God, because God has given you mercy, because God has given you grace, because God has saved you by his love, by the mercies of God that you present, notice this is a volitional choice, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here, the Apostle Paul makes this urgent appeal. He says, I beseech you by the mercies of God to present your bodies. Now, notice the New Testament Greek word for bodies is sumata. Now, sumata is an interesting word. What word do we get from the word sumata? What word do we get from that in English? That's right, sum. You get sum or summary. And so what Paul is saying here is, I beseech you, therefore, that you present your bodies. And he uses the word for bodies as Sumatra. What does that mean? It's better translated as the collective sum of who you are, your body, your mind, and your emotions. So what Paul is saying is, I'm beseeching you that you present your mind to Christ. You present your body to Christ. You present your emotions to Christ. You present the sum of everything you are to Christ. This is the message of that first angel. Fear God, obey God, make a decision in your mind to respect him, to please him in everything you do. And let that be translated into your life to give glory to God in the things that you look at. How would you feel if Jesus were sitting next to you when you were flipping the dial of the television? How would you feel if Jesus were with you when you walked into that TV theater? How would you feel if he was sitting next to you when you were flipping through the internet? How would you feel if Christ were with you in the late hours of the night when you're watching a late, late show? You see, Jesus invites us to give him our minds. And he's given us in Scripture a screen for our minds. You know, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, it says there 
that God is going to keep our minds or the whole world is going to lose its mind to worldliness, to secularism, to humanism. Then he tells us how to put a screen on our minds. You know, I live in Virginia and the state of Virginia, not far from Washington, D.C., and uh, at the summertime, we like to open our windows. My wife and I love to get the draft to come through, and, but we have screens on the windows. Why do you put screens on the windows? You put screens on the windows to keep the mosquitoes out. God puts a screen on our mind. Here in Philippians chapter 4, the Bible puts it this way in verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue, any praise, think on these things, whatever things are true. So you fill your mind with that which is false, and then you try to read the Bible, and the Bible seems boring, insipid, and dull. But why? Because you filled your mind with fictitious tales. You fill your mind with violence, and that changes your character, so you become impatient much more quickly because by beholding, we become changed. It's a law of the mind that it gradually adapts itself on the subjects it's allowed to dwell. See, this message of the three angels is a message of restoration, to restore us into the image of God by the transformation of our thinking process and the transformation of our minds. And so God appeals to us to give him our bodies, to give him our minds, to give, us our, give him our emotions. Romans 12, verse 1, you know where it says there, which is your reasonable service. I love the way Philip's translation puts it. I beseech you, therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you that you present your bodies, the sum of who you are, mental faculties, physical faculties, emotional faculties, as a living sacrifice. Well, Philip's translation says, as an intelligent act of worship. So when we come to Christ and give our whole lives to him, and make the mental decision to fear him, obey him, or respect him. When we make the decision to give glory to God in our hearts and minds, that indeed is an intelligent act of worship. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 adds, If anyone destroys the temple of God, see, we're temples, we are not a fun house. God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So our bodies are the temple of God. God longs for what we put in our minds and feed our brains with that mental food, what we feed our bodies with physical food. God wants to restore us into his image. So the image of God can shine gloriously without us and through us. You see, what you eat or drink impacts how you think. And so as we eat food that is unhealthful, it clogs the bloodstream, the red blood corpuscles bringing oxygen to the brain. Where does the Holy Spirit communicate to us? Not, from our, not through our big toes or our fingernails, but through our brains. And so God longs for us to be in health. Not only so we live 6, 7, 8, 10, 12 years longer. Not only so that we will be free from many of the diseases that afflict the human race in this generation. He longs for us to have healthy bodies. He came for us to be in abundant health, certainly. John 10, verse 10 says, I've come that you can have life and have it more abundantly. But there's something beyond that. The message of the first angel is to prepare us mentally and physically for the coming of Jesus. God longs through his Holy Spirit to prepare us for that great day when Jesus will come again. And he wants us to have clear minds so we think clearly, so we sense the moving of his spirit in our hearts and in our minds. So the appeal of Christ in this final generation is place your body, place your mind, place your emotions on the altar as a living sacrifice to Christ. Paul says, I beseech you, you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It is an appeal to make God the center of our lives. For some people, appetite is the center of their life. For some people, entertainment is the center of their life. For some people, dress is the center of their life. But God appeals to you. God appeals to me to make Jesus Christ the center of our lives. We give glory to God as we reveal his character to the world through lives committed to doing his will in this final moment of earth's history. In these last days of earth's history, 
in this end time of Earth's history, there is a message, a message that's pictured as being carried by three angels in midheaven. The story of these three cosmic messages is more thrilling than any Star Wars trilogy or any Star Wars drama. It is the intergalactic struggle, the battle for the universe. It is the battle for the throne. And God sends a message to us, a message as is important for this generation as Noah's message for his generation, a message as important as John the Baptist to prepare men and women for the first coming of Christ. It is a message to restore men and women into the image of God. It is a message to restore men and women back to knowing Christ in a deep, intimate way. It is a message that restores the mind and the thinking process, a message that restores health to the body. It is a message to fear God, to reverence, respect Him, and to make a commitment to obey Him. It's a message to give glory to Him, give Him glory in everything we eat and drink and every single thing we do. It is a message of grace, a message of salvation in Christ that transforms our lives into obedient believers. Now, the Apostle Paul calls us out of the pettiness of our self-made worlds to the largeness of the worlds that Christ made. Paul was in a prison. He was there in the Mamertine prison in Rome. Paul is an old man now. The year is in the mid-60s A.D., Paul writes with trembling hand. There are deeply etched lines upon his face. And he writes about his life. He writes back to the church at Philippi that he visited approximately 10 years before. And Paul writes these words. He says, hold fast to the word of life. Paul makes an appeal, an appeal to the generation that then was, and that appeal is made to us as well. Hold fast the word of life. Do not compromise your integrity and accept human tradition and man's opinions, but let your mind and heart be filled with the word of God. Hold fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Hold fast to the Bible. Cling to the word of God. Let the living Christ change your life by his grace so you're obedient to the word. Hold fast to the word of life so I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Paul says, I'm rejoicing in the hope of Christ, the hope of his salvation, the hope of the cross that gives me the assurance that my sins are forgiven, the hope of Jesus' high priestly ministry there, that from the sanctuary above, he'll give me power to endure this trial, the hope of his second coming, But Paul says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. I'm being poured out on the altar of sacrifice for Christ. Every single one of us pour out our lives for something. Paul poured out his life for Christ. He poured out his life to share Jesus, to live for Jesus, to be an ambassador for Christ. Every single one of us pour out our lives for something. You know, not everything that is legitimate is beneficial for the cause of Christ. I have people come to me all the time and they say, Pastor, what's wrong with this? Pastor, what's wrong with that? Pastor, what's wrong with the next thing? There are many things that may be legitimate, but as a Christian, not legalistically, you voluntarily choose not to do them. Why? Because you are so sold out for Christ. Now look, there is legitimate entertainment for the Christian, but not everything that is indeed legitimate we desire to do. Why not? Because our hearts are sold out 100% for Christ. Others may be able to do it, but you voluntarily, because of love for Christ, say, look, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. I was interested at one time, but I have a bigger purpose to live. I have a larger purpose to live. I have a grander purpose to live. I have a greater purpose to live for. I'm no longer interested in that. Invest your life in Christ and for Christ. That is the deepest joy. That is the greatest happiness in life. 
Some people pour out their lives in their work. Other people pour out their lives in sports. We all are pouring out our lives for something. And Jesus says, pour out your life in commitment to me. Pour out your life in service for me. Pour out your life in witness for me. Some people pour out their lives in pleasure and entertainment. They are pleasure mad. Did you read about that interesting experience, experiment that one of the great Eastern universities did with monkeys? They wanted to find out what was the greatest drive in these monkeys. So they took an electrode and put it in the pleasure center of the monkey's brain. They identified where that pleasure center was in the monkey's brain. And as they put that electrode in his brain, they were able to push a button outside of the cage of the monkey that sent an electrical impulse across the wires down into the electrical, through the probe, into the monkey's brain. Now the monkey, every time that electrical impulse would come, the monkey would jump up and clap and get happy, do cartwheels in the cage. Then they put food in the cage, press the electrode button. The monkey wouldn't eat the food. He was so excited about being so happy, so pleasurable. They put the most beautiful female monkey in the cage. He didn't care about that female at all, didn't care about his children at all. All he wanted to do was have pleasure. Then you know what they did? They put the pleasure button in the cage and taught the monkey how to push the pleasure button. The monkey kept pushing it, pushing it, putting The monkey actually killed himself from pleasure. There are scores of people in this life that are pouring their life out for worldly pleasure and entertainment. And as they do that, they are destroying their spiritual life because they're obsessed with the next greatest movie. They're obsessed with the next greatest music phenomena in the rock world. They're obsessed with the greatest pro next program on Netflix. And they're so absorbed with that that their spiritual life is being totally strangled. We all pour out our lives for something. Some people pour out their lives in pleasure and entertainment. Some people pour out their lives in time consuming, all absorbing, mind numbing digital devices. Now these things are certainly not wrong, used in proportion, used in moderation. But look, if that's what you're pouring your life out, if that destroys human relationships, if it absorbs your devotional time for Christ, you see the three angels' message in this first angel's message to fear God and give glory to him. It's not some superficial message like some child waiting in a kiddie's waiting pool to pick up pennies. I call you not to something superficial. I call you not to something that is simply child's play religion that makes you feel good. I call you today to something deep, to preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ, to fear God with all your heart, to live obedient, godly lives, to give glory to God. We all pour out our lives for something. Why not pour out your life for that which counts, that which matters for the kingdom of God? Why not pour out your life for Jesus Christ and make him number one in your life? Revelation will have a people that overcome. They overcome the worldliness and humanness that sucks the spiritual life out of us and strangles us. There are believers in every generation that have overcome and Christ appeals to you today by his grace, through his power to be an overcomer. Revelation 21 verse 7 says, at the end of time, those who overcome will inherit all things. God is something amazing for you, something beyond your wildest dreams. Don't throw it away for the cheap pleasures of this world. The Bible says that God will have a group of people. Revelation 14 verse 12, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They keep God's commandments not out of some legalistic obligation, but changed by his love, charmed by his grace, redeemed by his power. They live obedient lives because they know that that is the very best way to live. They know that's the happiest way to live. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Notice they keep the commandments of God and they have something. What do they have? 
the faith of Jesus. Not simply faith in Jesus, but the quality of Christ's faith lives in them. They have the faith of Jesus living in their lives because they know Christ. They've spent time with Christ. They've prayed to him. They've opened the word and Jesus has entered and changed their lives. We overcome, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 says, Seeing then, seeing then that we have what? A great high priest who's passed through the heavens. What's his name? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast. In other words, let us not give up. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, every point you're tempted with, he was tempted with, as we are, yet without sin. We can come, come to Jesus. Come to the sanctuary. Come and receive his strength and power for living. The Bible says, let us therefore do what? Come boldly, that's confidently, to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help when in time of need. Do you have a time of need? Let us come. Come to that sanctuary in Christ, by Christ, through Christ. You can be overcomer. Without Christ's example, we have no ideal. Without Christ's death, we have no forgiveness. Without Christ's resurrection, we have no hope. Without Christ's intercession, we have no power. Without Christ's mediation, we have no favor with God. Without Christ's daily presence, we have no assurance of victory. Without Christ's promise of his return, we have no confidence in a better tomorrow. It is about Christ. The book of Revelation is about Christ. The prophecies of Revelation 14, 6 to 12 are about Christ. Jesus says to you, come, is the response of your heart, not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. Listen, as Charles sing. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved. Exalted, not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ. In every look and action, not I, but Christ. In every thought and word. Not I, but Christ, to gently soothe in sorrow. Not I, but Christ, to wipe the falling tear. Not I, but Christ, to lift the weary burden. Not I. Christ to hush all way, all fear. Christ, only Christ, no idle word ever falling. Christ, only Christ, no needless bustling sound. Christ, Christ, no self-important bearing, Christ only Christ, no trace of I be found, not I, but Christ, my every need supplying, not I, but Christ my strength and help to be Christ only Christ for my body soul and spirit Christ only Christ here and eternally here and Eternal. 
Have you sensed Christ speaking to your heart? In the book of Revelation, Jesus speaks and the beast speaks. The beast appeals for pleasure. The beast appeals for power. The beast appeals through money. But Jesus makes a divine appeal to you right now. And as Christ is appealing to your heart with his still, small voice, would you like to say, Jesus, I want to respond. I want to respond by giving my life to you. I want the words of this song to be the words of my heart. Not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. Not I, but Christ. Be seen, be known, be heard. I don't want to listen to the roar of the beast, the roar of this world's entertainment, the roar of this world's pleasure, the roar of this world's appetite. I want to listen to the Spirit of Christ and give my life to him right now. Is that your decision as we pray, oh Jesus? Thank you so much that your way is the way of life abundant. Yours is the way of true happiness. Yours is the way of joy complete. And just now, the desire of our heart is to say, not I, but Christ. Be honored, loved, exalted. We want Christ to live in our hearts and flow through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us, my friend. And the appeal of Christ is the appeal to your heart to be ready when he comes. As you go today, go with the great blessing and sense of his divine presence in your life.